All right. So Kingdom Hearts 2, in my opinion, is the final game that essentially tries to make itself seem normal, yet have some complex details. From here on out, after Kingdom Hearts 2, they get a little more complex, so I'll try my best to put them in the best way I can. So, without further ado, Kingdom Hearts 2. So Kingdom Hearts 2 starts off with a new character, Roxas. And what Roxas is doing is, is the last week of summer vacation. That's right, summer vacation. We all remember those days back when we were kids, when it was so fun, summer vacation. You didn't have to go to school, you didn't have any homework, you could just have fun, go to the beach, or whatever you want to do. And we always dreaded the last week of summer. Because we all knew we'd have to go back to school and we'd be back to doing homework and lectures and blah, blah, blah. So, Roxas decides he's not going to allow that to happen. He's going to have a fun last week of summer vacation. So, he meets up with his four friends. Sorry. His three friends, Hayner, who is essentially the rival jerky leader type. The comic relief, kind of fat kid, Pence. And the stereotypical girl of the group, Olette. And so, since this is the last week of summer vacation... They break it up into like seven days. So I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do day by day uh, story. Day one is the most confusing in my opinion, and the most ridiculous. Day one is essentially someone has stole photographs. That's right, photographs, and that's everyone in town has had their photographs stolen. But that's not all. The thief also stole the word photograph. So throughout the first day, until the end of the first day, instead of the word photograph, there's nothing. They mouth it, but the word doesn't come out. And if I can break the storyline for a second, that seems... Dumb. That seems really dumb in my opinion. Because, and I know we live in a world, at least Kingdom Hearts lives in a world of like magic and whimsy. But, come on. Really? The word was stolen? Come on. Okay, back to the story. So, with all the photographs stolen, everyone is accusing Roxas and his team so, Damon is also trying to get the photographs back, but it's also trying to clear your name. The main accuser is Cypher, Raijin, and Fujin from Final Fantasy VIII. Now, these are how they were in Final Fantasy VIII, which is kind of weird story-wise. So, Leon is Squall, but older... But in Twilight Town, which is the setting for this, Cypher, Raijin, and Fujin are 16? I mean, I guess worlds have different time flow, but that's a little inconsistent in my opinion. And so, there are sen they're essentially your rival... I don't want to use the word gang, but I'm going to put it like that. They're your rival gang. But they're also with another character from Final Fantasy. Vivian from Final Fantasy IX. He really doesn't do anything story-wise. He's just essentially a Cypher fanboy. So, after pretty much getting the tutorial on how battle works... Roxas defeats Cypher. 
who then Pence tries to take a picture to commemorate this moment, and he gets the camera and the photograph stolen away by essentially a living hard to explain. So this entity just sort of grabs it and runs away. So Roxas, being the hero type, immediately runs after it because he's found the thief. So the thing goes all the way through the forest and stops in front of a mansion with Roxas catching up and the thing tells Roxas that they found him their liege. Which, for those who don't understand what that means, liege is essentially like a lord. Peons back in, like, the Middle Ages would say, yes, my liege, to sort of, like, it's like a higher-up, essentially. It's a peon talking to a higher-up. And so Roxas tried to defeat it with his bat. I'll get into that later. And like Sora's wooden sword in Kingdom Hearts 1, it does nothing. He can't hurt it. And so after trying for so long, he eventually gets the Keyblade. He gets Sora's Keyblade, to be specific, the Kingdom Key. And with it, he can defeat the Entity which drops all the photographs that were stolen and Pence's camera. With Roxas' friends coming up just the tail end, going, hey, we may not be the thieves, but we at least found the thing. We never found the thief, but we found all the stuff so we can just return it. With Roxas being confused because, you know, it happened in front of everyone, but the day ends with, essentially, them laughing because all the photographs are of Roxas. And Pence kind of makes a joke that maybe they're trying to steal the real Roxas and was mistaken by the photographs. Weird, I know. So, every night, you're going to get a little uh, snippet of, essentially, Kingdom Hearts 1. It's not long, and it also says Restoration X percent. That'll come into play a little bit later. And Roxas wakes up, sort of like, what was up with that dream? So now let's go on to day two. Day two is the kids getting jobs. It's essentially a tutorial for, like, the minigames that you'll face throughout the game. But, essentially, the, all the kids get jobs so they can pay to go to the beach. You know, because they haven't gone to the beach this whole summer. Which, I don't know why they wouldn't until now. So they said, let's go to the beach. So they all raise up enough money and they give it to Roxas. Who essentially bumps into a cloaked figure... And tries to go pay for the tickets, but realizes he doesn't have the money. And he thinks that the cloaked man stole his money. With the rest of his friends going, what man? You fell, got up, wiped yourself off, and entered. Look, dude, if you don't have the money, we'll just try tomorrow. And that ends day two. Day three is... Hayner says that he uh, that they're going to the beach and that he has a way to do it. So meet them. So to meet him at the train station. So when Roxas goes out, he sees that the monsters are attacking. The thief is essentially attacking. And so he goes to fight them and helps essentially defend the town with uh, with Cypher. He see he 
battling, and then just time stops. And he's told to go to the mansion by Naminé. Naminé tells him to essentially go to the mansion, but is ultimately cut off by, for those who have, uh, for those who have seen my story or have played Chain of Memories, um, he stopped, she stopped by Diz. Diz pretty much cuts it off and restarts time with, uh, all the monsters gone. And he go, and the day pretty much ends from there. The next day, Roxas gets up and essentially goes to meet his friends. And Hayner is kind of pissed at him because, well, Roxas kind of blew them off. And so they ended up not going to the beach. Because it wouldn't be the same without Roxas. And they start saying that Roxas has betrayed them because he spent the whole day with Cypher and his cronies and blah blah blah. And he goes, why don't we go, why don't we go today? Roxas goes, why don't we go today? You know, I'm sorry about yesterday, let's just go today. In which, Hayner goes, nah, I'm just not feeling it, man. And he leaves. And so... With, um, after Roxas leaves, he's sort of like, oh, why did I, why did I blow them off? And he just, he throws a stick. Well, he tries to get the keylight to come out by grabbing a stick, and he just, he's not doing it. He just can't. And so he throws, he throws the stick and hits the cloaked man. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry. And the cloaked man just disappears. This cloaked man is going to be very, um, Important later on. So just remember that this cloaked man has been appearing time and time again. And that it is the same cloaked man. So, Roxas decides, I'm just going to explore the town. And so, that's essentially that. He explores the town. And the day ends. Day five. They realize that they haven't done their summer assignment and so what they decide to do is essentially let's go and do the seven mysteries of twilight town which is essentially just opening another point of twilight town and most of the stories are essentially nothing it ends up like rocks is for example, Roxas has to uh, check on a ball that's being thrown in this alleyway. And balls just keep coming time and time again. And when Roxas gets to the end, a ball throws by and Hainer goes, Oh, Roxas, you're the one that kicked it? And essentially they debunk it as, Oh, some kid probably kicked it and like disappeared. And that's that. Essentially those types of things. Like they easily get debunked. And so, the final one is the Phantom Train. In which, Roxas sees the Phantom Train, no one else does. There's a lot of Roxas sees something, and it doesn't, and no one else sees it. The next day, Roxas, uh, it's the Moogle Battle. The Moogle Battle is essentially uh, a tournament for uh, kids to essentially beat each other up. And during the Moogle fight, you first start, start off with fighting Hayner, who you defeat. Um, and then it's Vivian versus Cypher, who Vivian defeats Cypher, which Cypher going, that's not Vivian. And so... The finals are you versus Vivian, and once you defeat Vivian, I don't know if you lose, something else happens. I've never lost, so I, I think you have to win it, but Vivian's not too hard. 
Ah, once you defeat Vivian, it revealed that it's not Vivian, it's one of those uh, creatures. And more creatures come, and you eventually, and essentially, time stops, and you defeat the creatures. When another cloak man comes up, and he goes, Roxas, I finally found you! And then, and like trying to talk him up, and it's revealed to be Axel from Chain of Memories. See, Axel didn't die at the end of Chain of Memories. He gets defeated, and he like disappears to destroy some of the other uh, organization members. And he just like disappears. He, he essentially like escapes Castle Oblivion. And so Axel's like, Don't you remember me, buddy? We we were best friends. And disappears going, Don't believe that man. He's telling you lies. And they essentially are like Roxas, 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 Rox Which Roxas goes, Hayner, Pence, Olette and snaps out of the time warp with him being the victor. And so now, who's ready for another Final Fantasy cameo? The champion is none other than Setzer from Final Fantasy VI. For those who don't know Final Fantasy VI, Setzer is essentially a gambler. And so Setzer goes, I will pay you whatever amount you want. Just let me win. And here's the thing. It really doesn't matter if you defeat him or not. This is solely optional. I've defeated them all. I defeat them every time. But if you do defeat them, you just get the champion's belt. And at the end, um, Roxas gets a trophy that has four colored marbles in them. And they go up to the top of the clock tower in Twilight Town, sort of hanging over it. And... Uh, he gives one of the orb, one of the marbles... To each one of his friends. He keeps the blue one and the others get their marbles. As Roxas is looking up at the sun in it, which should hurt his eyes, he gets up and he goes, What about. and falls off the clock tower. <laughs> He's falling and falling and falling and falling and falling. And he gets to connect with Kyrie. And. To put it into perspective, this is about a year after Kingdom Hearts 1. I don't know how long after Chain of Memories it is, but Kingdom Hearts, it's a one year after Kingdom Hearts 1. And so, <laughs> this is mean on Kyrie's part. So, she's talking to Selfie, who I didn't bring up in the, my Kingdom Hearts 1 uh, story point, because ultimately... Those cameos are not important to the story in any way. Hell, Sora doesn't even care what happens to her, Tidus from Final Fantasy X, or Waka from Final Fantasy X. And these are kid versions, not the actual uh, characters. Well, <sighs> well, anyways, Kyrie's talking to Selfie, and... <laughs> Selby doesn't remember Sora at all. She doesn't know what Kyrie's talking about. Kyrie knows there's another boy, but she can't remember who it was. She remembers Riku, but she can't remember Sora. Until Roxas somehow gets in contact with her all the way in Destiny Islands. Like a telepathy type thing. And essentially. <laughs> He goes, I remember you. You're important to that boy. And Kyrie goes, what was that boy's name? And Roxas just goes, Roxas doesn't say anything. Sora actually goes, gee, thanks, Kyrie. Thanks for remembering me. And that triggers her memory. So Kyrie goes all the way down to uh, the shores and lets off a bottle with a message. A message in a bottle. She goes, I'll meet you soon, Sora. And so, the next day happens, and essentially, Roxas goes, goes how did I survive that fall? In which, and when he goes to pretty much talk to his friends, they pretty much go, 
What are you talking about, man? And so... Nomine goes, Roxas, meet me at the mansion. And so, Roxas essentially goes, okay, I want to meet you. And, oh, I missed some. Um, during the seven uh, mysteries of Twilight Town, um... The last one is essentially the girl in the mansion. And then we're planning on going tomorrow to explore the mansion. And that's when Roxas sort of has talk with Nomine. No one else sees her but Roxas. And they sort of like have a conversation about who he and her are. Which she goes, you're a nobody. She goes, he goes, thanks. Now, I'll get into what nobodies are later. But essentially, that's the important scene there. Is that essentially... Herself and Roxas are beings that should not exist. In her words. And he goes, I want to meet you again. And so now it gets to this point where he is now going to the mansion. And the mansion has a giant padlock. Like, I mean, a fucking giant padlock on the front gate in which Nominate goes you know what to do he summons up the keyblade unlocks it which that's something I sort of skimmed over the keyblade has the ability to unlock and lock anything that essentially has a keyhole and so he unlocks the gate walks through and now you pretty much explore the mansion now, you go up to Nominate's room, and you see a couple of pictures that um, I'll get into a little bit later. But on his way to the mansion, he meets up with Axel, and he goes, Do you remember me, man? He goes, Yeah, we used to be best friends. Oh, what's the name of our boss? And he goes, Mmm. -hmm. And essentially, Axel gets time-stopped there. And you see another scene where Axel pretty much goes, my best friend's gone. He's, he's not himself. And essentially that. So, Axel leaves. Uh, so, Roxas goes to this mansion. And he realizes there's a basement. In the basement, he sees essentially a computer set up. And... Diz essentially goes, I can't remember if it's Diz or Nominate, someone tells him that essentially he's in a digital world. So that kind of explains how the thief stole the word photograph, because he just sort of stole the programming in every character's vocabulary so that, he, so that they wouldn't say it. Obviously, Roxas is enraged. He utterly destroys this computer, which opens a door. He walks through and meets up with our best buddy, Axel. Now, at this point, Roxas remembers everything. He remembers he was a member of this organization and that he ultimately left and that Axel and him were best friends. And he remembers everything. But Axel doesn't care. And so you ultimately get shown something new. Roxas wields two Keyblades. And the Keyblades he, wear, he wields are essentially one of light and one of dark. Which is new to Axel as well as to everyone else. This is the first character that has wielded two Keyblades. And so you have an awesome battle with Axel, who ultimately gets defeated. Axel goes, I'll see you on the other side. Or, I'll see you in another life, one of those two. He goes, I will... Goes, yeah. You and I will be friends in another life. He goes, Tummy, I don't have another life. 
and Axel fizzles away. Roxas goes through the door when he finds Donald and Goofy in their pods. And at this point, I skimmed over some, but I'll really get into it at this next point. When Roxas opens the door, inside is a giant pot. And Digital Diz pretty much goes, it's your destiny to become Sora. And so when Roxas gets up to the giant pod, it opens up to reveal Sora sleeping right there. Now, I've evaded this because it was kind of spoilerish. But I guess now's a perfect time to say it. What Roxas is, is essentially Sora's nobody. And so all of Sora's memories have been going into Roxas because he's connected to Sora. Now, I'm not going to explain what a nobody is, essentially, but... Just remember that Roxas is Sora's nobody. Because I'm going to bring this up a little bit later in actually the next game that I'll be talking about. But eventually, but essentially, Roxas goes, <laughs> by summer vacation's over, but yours is just starting. And he essentially becomes Sora again. Sora essentially becomes whole with all of his memories... And that ends, essentially, Roxas' story. Okay, so now let's talk about Sora's story. I actually took a break after recording Roxas' story to essentially gather all my thoughts during this. I may have missed something in Roxas' story, just like I'll probably miss something in Sora's story, but bear with me. So Sora wakes up from his slumber with Dolly and Goofy, and, and he's still wearing his Kingdom Hearts 1 gear, which is short. He's gone through a growth spurt. It has been a whole year. And so they don't know where they are. And so they just sort of explore through. Now, I'm going to get this off my chest Right now, Roxas reunites with Sora in the digital world. But Roxas wakes up in the real world. Okay, I just want to get that off right now. So, Sora is pretty much going through the... Uh, going through Twilight Town, and he eventually goes to the secret hideout of Roxas, Hainer, Pence, and Olette, in which Hainer goes, Yo, this is our pad. What are you doing here? And he goes, I'm sorry. I just didn't know what was here. Thought I'd check it out. Hainer goes, Now you know. Get lost. With Olette going, Calm down, Hainer. And they start to do the same talking amongst themselves. And essentially, um, Hainer, Pence, and Olette essentially help Sora get used to his surroundings. Excuse me. And he's told that uh, the king is in town. And then he's up at the train station to essentially meet up with King Mickey up at the train station. And so, Sora, Don, and Goofy all rush up to the train station where they find, well, the creatures. Who, I'm going to say right now, these beings are known as nobodies. So, anytime I talk about nobodies, this is what I'm talking about. And so, with these new entities, Sora doesn't know how to handle it. 
So he just sort of fights it out, and he just gets too much, and so are just like, ugh, I'm too tired. With King Mickey just coming in and dispatching them all. In which King Mickey goes, everyone's so excited, like, Your Majesty! Which King Mickey goes, shh, shut up! Because he's wearing uh, uh, a cloak. But it's very obvious it's Mickey because he has those giant ears. So anyways, he goes, he goes, enter, get on the train. This is your payment. And he hands Sora uh, the bag that Rox has had, such as the digital world. And so Sora goes, okay. And so he goes to the train station, pays for a ticket, and gets on the train, and off he goes. Now, with Hainer, Pence, and Olet pretty much saying, Bye, Sora, Donald, and Goofy. Sora actually cries a little. He doesn't know why he's crying, but he is. He does. He sheds a tear. And so... Off they go. And this is the mysterious ghost train from Roxas's story. It goes out of nowhere, warps to another world, and here we're at a mysterious tower. Sora gets out, and we find a familiar question mark character at the front door. It's Pete from King Mickey's from Mickey's story. Pete, Donald, and Goofy pretty much go. He was banished by the king uh, for essentially being an asshole. So why is he back? Who let him out from his prison? And da da da. da. And Pete essentially reveals that he sent a heartless into the tower to uh, turn. The master of the tower, whose name is Yen Sid, who's from Fantasia, for those who don't know, uh, into a heartless, because he's really powerful and all that. With Donald and Goofy going, Yen Sid! And when Pete turns around to see who it is, he sees that it's those pipsqueaks. Obviously, he remembers Donald and Goofy. And... You don't have a fight with Pete. He just sort of like runs away. And they rush up the tower. When they get to the top, they meet Yen Sid. Who pretty much was expecting Sora to get was get here because of the king. Yen Sid was King Mickey's trainer. Essentially, Yen Sid taught Mickey how to use the keyblade. And all that. So, obviously, everyone shows respect, and Yen Sid goes, get a new pair of clothes, okay? And so, Sora goes in, gets a new set of clothes, and he has a new power, but because I'm not going into the gameplay aspect, it essentially, what these clothes are, are, uh, it unlocks the power of the heart, and allows Sora to wield two Keyblades. Now, we don't know why Zora can wield two Keyblades? There's a theory, but it'd be spoilerish for another game, so I'll wait until then to tell you about it. So, with the new wardrobe, Zora goes back to Yen Sid, who essentially goes read up on these books that will tell the past, the present, and the future. The future pretty much is nothing, by the way. It's like some sort of like, maybe Sora will win, maybe he won't. Essentially like that. But the book of the past tells of Sora's previous journey, and the book of the present essentially tells of what the new threat essentially is. With Yen Sid telling of what the actual threats are, and goes down the basic rundown of, there's the Heartless that Sora's fought, there's a new enemy called the Nobodies, which, okay, Nobodies are essentially, when the heart is taken away by a Heartless, 
The empty body stays and becomes a nobody. If the body is a powerful being, then they become, they form together to create Organization 13. The Organization 13, despite the fact that this is new, Sora has already met them, but because of Nabine's doing, he doesn't know the organization. But Larxene, Axel, Zexion, Lexius, so on and so forth, all the bad guys from Chain of Memories are members of Organization 13 that are destroyed. Except for Axel. Well, I guess he's dead now. That Rox has defeated him. So, Organization 13, there are essentially the organization made up of 13 strong nobodies, in which Roxas was a member of Organization 13. And so, with this new information, Sora gets on the gummy ship with Donald and Goofy, and they start their adventure. First up is Hollow Bastion. Now, Hollow Bastion is a little different because you're not going into the castle this time. You're actually in the town surrounding the castle. So this is a new Hollow Bastion, despite it's a recurring world. And essentially, this is where the Final Fantasy characters are. Yuffie, Aerith, Sid, and Leon are part of a world restoration team. Now, this, ultimately, this first visit is essentially establishing where the Final Fantasy characters are, as well as, near the end, establishing that the organization knows Sora is onto them now. Because they make an appearance and sort of like, go, you can't defeat us. In time, you will lose, essentially. And they go away, ending Hall Bastion's first visit. Now, each world that we're going to go through has essentially, there's going to be two visits to each world. And each one has essentially, I'm going to break it down now. Each first visit is going to be oriented around the Heartless. And the second visit is oriented around essentially the organization stepping in. So just so you know, I'm just going to skip over most of the world stories because again it has no bearing on the overlaying story the overall story so the first set of worlds are beast castle which is obviously beast's world from beauty and the beast then you have the land of dragons which is mulan's world and then olympus coliseum which actually this Olympus Coliseum is more oriented around the underworld. Again, it has no relevance to the over the overall story. So it's just the underworld. With this done, you get a message essentially saying, Donald, Goofy, and Sora, please come to Disney Castle. Which we saw in Kingdom Hearts 1, but we could never go. That world was always on the world map, but you couldn't go there in Kingdom Hearts 1. So now you can go there, and essentially it's Queen Minnie is in danger. So they go over, and it's revealed that essentially the Heartless are attacking the world, Despite the fact that this world should be impenetrable to the Heartless. So, the first action is they have to go save Queen Minnie. And so, Sora escorts Queen Minnie to the throne room, while Don and Goofy pretty much protect everyone else. And so, when Minnie gets to the throne... Uh, she opens up a passage underneath the throne that leads to the cornerstone of light, 
but there are thorns uh, protruding on it, which is sort of holding the light at bay, allowing darkness to come in. Now, Queen Minnie has no idea what to do about this, but Maleficent shows up and pretty much goes, I have the cornerstone of light, you might as well give up now. Darkness will take over this world, essentially. And so, Sora, Donald, and Goofy have to go find Merlin, who is in Hollow Bastion. So they go all the way back to Hollow Bastion, meet up with Merlin. Merlin goes, okay, I'm just going to go to the Cornerstone of Light. He starts inspecting the thorns, and he goes, okay, this is taking place in a special world. And that someone has created a door to this special world. We need to find out who's doing it and essentially lock this door so that they can't come in and mess up this cornerstone of light. And so Merlin makes this door and he tells them, no matter what you do, do not mess up anything in there. And everyone goes, okay, we will. And in you go. Now, in this place, now this world is the Timeless River. And it's essentially the world of the 1940s Walt Disney animation. You know, like Steamboat Willie, where Mickey and Pete made their first appearance. And it's a bunch of the other characters from that timeline. And it's essentially a world before... The castle is built, and the cornerstone of light is essentially vulnerable. And so, the mission is you have to find this door and lock it. So they start searching around, and they find Pete. And they immediately go, he must be the one messing it all up. Now, Pete just had his boat stolen, but Pete's sort of like an angry, like, multi like, why, you oughta? And he fights, and Pete has no idea what's even going on. He just knows someone stole his boat. So, Donald, Goofy, and Sora go, this feels wrong, and they pretty much apologize and leave. Leave the area. When they come back, they find four mysterious uh, portals which have no overlaying story. So essentially, you defeat those four challenges and you find out uh, like little memories of how this door came to be. And I'm going to spoil it here. It's Pete. At the end, you find out it's Pete. Pete opened the door. Because he wanted to go back to the times where he was a badass. He was a captain of a ship and he was aw, it was all great. So through his pure will, he summoned up this portal to the past and Maleficent goes, we could use this. And so essentially, Sora and Donald Goofy go, we've been tricked. And so they go down to the wharf to go confront Pete when you find out there's actually to Pete. Now this is kind of weird because Donald and Goofy turn into their old selves like how they looked around that era of animation but new Pete like modern Pete still looks like modern Pete and they're still old Pete. So you find out that modern Pete has essentially stolen his boat back and has the cornerstone of light on the back of it and you have to stop Pete from essentially escaping. So you get the cornerstone of light back and Pete runs off and old Pete runs off to go chase after him and then you have an official boss fight with Pete. After you defeat Pete he opens the door and sort of locks it and then they leave the Timeless River. 
When they come back, the thorns are gone, and everything is back to the way it should. And now from here on out, the Heartless will not be in Disney Castle. Because the Cornerstone of Light is protecting the world from the darkness. And so with that done, we get a new set of worlds, which, again, I'm just going to... They have no over uh, overall story uh, in it. So, the first one we meet up with is Port Royal, which is part of the Caribbean world. Then, that opens up Atlantica, which is just a one giant minigame. World. It's essentially a minigame world. But it also opens up Agraba and Halloween Town. And when you defeat both of those, one or both of them, it opens up the Pride Land, which is Simba's world. And so, this is all the worlds in the game. Like I said, the like I've explained, the first phase is essentially the Heartless and pretty much getting to know the world itself. And the second visit will be like the organization stepping in and causing more havoc. And so after you've uh, defeated Agrabah and Halloween Town, something new happens in Bastion, and you go all the way back and... This is where some of the story comes into, but a large majority of it is essentially um, they found where Ansem's office was. And so they go, so Sora, Donald, and Goofy pretty much run to a separate part of the castle. Like they have to fight their way all the way through it because someone has jacked the program of the uh, of essentially the protection program that Sid has created to protect the town from the heartless. Someone has hijacked it and essentially it's now causing harm opposed to protecting. And it's also creating heartless through some way. But anyways, uh, that's the overall story. That doesn't all happen at once. The first, because again, it has no really overbearing storyline to the overall story. I'm just cramming it in now. I understand that this all ha doesn't happen at once, but it's ultimately, this is how it's going to end up coming out. But the overall story is, they find Antonum's uh, office, and it's revealed that Antonum wasn't actually Antonum because Mickey tells, they meet up with Mickey who says, Antonum isn't Antonum. That there was a man named Antonum the Wise, who was essentially the leader of Hollow Bastion. And he had an apprentice who is Antonum. But his Ansem's real name is Xehanort. And so Xehanort created this computer to essentially make, uh, to do research and keep all of his data then, there. And you need to know the password to get in, which Thor and Donald and Goofy are just sort of like tapping away. And they get sucked into the computer. Welcome to Tron's Worlds. Uh, I don't remember. I think it's like Electric Paranoia or something like that. Electric Paranoids. Something like that. Now, now again, this has no overbearing uh, story. But Tron's World is essentially... The story of Tron. It's trying to get the computer back from the MCP. But Tron needs to... In order to get Sora, Doll, and Goofy out... He needs to... 
they need to find the password to the DTD. And so, eventually, uh, Tron opens up a way so they can leave to go find this password in the world of users. And so when Donald, Goofy, and Sora come out, they go, what's the DTT? With uh, Mickey pretty much moving a painting over, you find out DTD stands for Door to Darkness. And Ansem, sorry, Xehanort, was researching essentially darkness. And in Kingdom Hearts 1, you had these Ansem reports, which essentially tells of, like, the Heartless and what the Heartless do. And it's all about the Heartless and his research towards it. And eventually it's revealed that Ansem essentially accepts being a Heartless. And that every symbol that is on a heartless. Like, some heartless have a symbol of, like, that heart. It's broken. Well, some don't. The ones with the symbol are artificial, while the ones that don't are natural heartless. And there are a few natural heartless. There's more manufactured than there are regular. And so, uh, Sora types in Door to Darkness and allows Tron to essentially take some control and reestablish the uh, what was uh, what the problem was and so with that done it now becomes a fight to protect uh, to protect uh, Hollow Bastion because now the Heartless are being rambunctious and they're fighting it out and all this. But it's the start of the upbringing, so Star, Doll, and Goofy get called back to Twilight Town, where it's sort of revealed that Kyrie was led there by Pluto, and that Axel was trying to kidnap her, but Pluto led her into a gate and it led all the way to Twilight Town. And so Kyrie is talking to Hayner, Pence, and Olette about Sora and they go, yeah, she, yeah, he was here and all this when Axel busts in and goes, hey, you're coming with me and essentially kidnaps Kyrie. When Sora gets there, Hayner, Pence, and Olette are pretty much going, Oh, hey, Kyrie was here, but she got kidnapped by one of the organization members. And now it kicks off the second visit. When you complete the first set of second visits, like Beast Castle, uh, Land of Dragons, and Olympus Coliseum, now, I'm going to get into a little bit of these ones because it has something to do with the organization. Excuse me, I still have a little bit of a cold. So, in Beast Castle, Beast is essentially raging because someone stole his rose. For those who don't know Beauty and the Beast, Beast is cursed and he has to find true love before the rose wilts. So he's very protective over this rose because he needs to know how long he has left. And so he pretty much starts raging and he traps all of his uh, all of his servants in the dungeon are now pretty much going, Hey, Beast, can you calm down? And he essentially is being a total ass to Bell, and it's revealed that it's Zigbar. Zigbar, sorry, Zaldin. Sorry, it's Zaldin. Zaldin is, has stolen the rose, and he goes, hey, which is more important, Bell or the rose? Which Beast can't make a decision, but Bell actually breaks free, 
and meets up with the Beast. Zaldin going, you bitch. And you, Sora, Dog, Goofy, and Beast all fight Zaldin, defeating him, and it brings happiness to Beast Castle. In the land of dragons, it's essentially taken the point after Mulan is, uh, after Mulan has essentially, uh, been kicked out of the army. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. She's not in the arm. He, uh, it's after the event of Mulan. And she's just sort of... She meets up with... Uh, Sora, Doll, and Goofy up on the mountains. And she sort of goes... Uh, she sort of goes, let's go uh, meet with the Emperor. Because I think he's in trouble. And so, uh, at that time, Heartless are now swarming the mountain, and you see a cloaked figure sort of fight, but he's wielding Riku's keyblade. So, Sora goes, that had to have been Riku, but why did he attack me? But there's more pressing issues because the, uh... The Imperial Palace is now being going to be under attack by the Heartless. And so Sora runs down to the palace. And of course, because he's with Mulan, and they're all heroes to China, um, they make it in time. And as they're entering, uh, they meet up with the Emperor and the Emperor goes, oh, I already knew this was happening because a cloaked man said that you guys would come and with it a danger would attack. And that one of the dragons would attack the palace. And so Sora goes, oh, that must have been Riku. And as he's leaving to go fight the dragon, Heartless, uh, he meets a cloaked figure who he thinks is Riku. So he goes, Riku! And it's revealed that it was Zigbar. Zigbar goes, I don't know who you're talking about, man. And sends his nobodies to fight Sora. And so after Sora dispatches them, it's a, he, uh, he goes to defeat the dragon, ending the second visit to Land of Dragons. With Olympus Coliseum, it's just the cup. It's actually, um, Orin, I didn't get into this, Orin from Final Fantasy X is, was called to defeat Hercules, but he goes rogue and sides with Sora, Donald, and Goofy. But now, in the second visit, Orin has his willpower taken away, and Sora, Donald, and Goofy go to give it back to him. Goes all the way up to Hades' place, grabs the, grabs the Orin statue, and runs back to essentially give or in his willpower back. With that happening, there's really nothing else there. It's just Hades going, you know what, that's it. I'm going to fight you guys now. And you defeat Hades, and that's the end of the second visit to Olympus Coliseum. After all that's done, throughout... You get called back to Hollow Bastion, where now the system has gone full rogue and Heartless are being created from the computer. And so Sordon and Goofy go, something must have happened to Tron. And so they go back into Tron's world, and throughout it all, they go and defeat the MCP, and they regain... Uh, control the computer, and everything goes good. Everything is perfectly fine, and everything's great. With the end of that, it's now a fight with all the Heartless, because the Heartless have gone so much that now Sora has to essentially 
defeat the swarm of heartless. And we and he's tag teams with all of uh, the Final Fantasy characters. But on his way to there, he meets up with one of the one another organization member named Dynex, who I didn't bring up in Olympus Coliseum because essentially Dynex steals the ability to fight in the underworld because it's like this Olympus metal or stone or something like that, which allows uh, which allows you to fight in there. But ultimately, he's a coward and he just goes here, take it. And he runs away. This is the official fight with Dynex. And so, after Sora defeats Dynex, a rock slide comes down to crush King Mickey, which Goofy pushes Mickey out of the way and takes the brunt of the damage. Everyone thinks Goofy is dead. And so... Mickey goes no more hiding, throws his cloak away, and now he's full force in the battlefield now. Donald goes berserk and starts fighting, and so does Sora. And now they're all fighting to the center of... Uh, center of this sort of, like, area with Heartless, because around the castle is this huge abundance of Heartless... And so they're finding the way to that moat of Heartless. And so when they get to the center, to this like giant battlefield place, it's now the battle of the 1,000 Heartless. Where it's literally Sora defeats 1,000 Heartless on his own. At the end, we meet up with the leader of Organization 13, who's revealed his name is... Zemnis. And he is Xehanort's nobody. Like Ansem was Xehanort's heartless. Zemnis is Xehanort's nobody. And so Zemnis sort of like berates Sor and goes, goes, keep struggling all you want. But eventually the fight with the Heartless just becomes too much. And Donald and Goofy Goofy wakes up and rejoins the fight and everyone and it's revealed that Goofy wasn't dead, he was just knocked out. And at the end of this fight, essentially Sora falls into the darkness and he's saved by they think it's Riku because at the bottom is uh, a box of sea salt ice cream and the picture of Roxas, Hayner, Pence, and Olette in front of the mansion. So when they get back to the gummy ship, they sort of go, I don't know what's going on, but I think Riku saved me. And so you continue with the second missions with uh, second visits to the rest of the world minus Disney Castle and uh, Timeless River because they're done. They're completely done. And throughout it all Twilight Town is starting to disappear from the map. Like something's going on in Twilight Town but it doesn't become apparent until you've completed the second visit to the mall. And so now, let me get into the second visit for Port Royal. Sorry, I had to think of the name there. So now, in Port Royal, the medallions, for those who don't know Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, these pirates are cursed by these medallions because they stole from an Aztec uh, battleground, and they're cursed. So, so long as these medallions are not in this one place and the blood retaken, they're ghosts. And so, the medallions are essentially taken again, but they're given to this one heartless, who essentially is immortal. 
Sora, Donald, Goofy, Jack Sparrow, they cannot beat it. And essentially, they get shipwrecked. And it's all being led by Luxord from the Organization 13. And so, Luxord essentially... You don't fight Luxord, but he's sort of like... After you defeat the Reaper, uh, Heartless, he sort of disappears. And that ends the second visit to Port Royal. The second visit to Agrabah is essentially Jafar... Everyone thinks Jafar is coming back, but in fact, it was a trap to take over Agrabah, essentially. Until you fight Jafar, and that's the end of that. In Halloween Town, there's. It's just. Uh, something is stealing the presents from San, Sandy Claus. If you don't know how the uh, nightmare, the nightmare before Christmas, it's Santa Claus. Uh, someone's stealing presents from Sandy Claus, and it's revealed just be some heartless looking for a heart, essentially, or joy in a heart, and that ends that after you defeat that heartless. In the Pride Lands, it's Simba being haunted by the Shadow of Scar, which is later revealed to be just a giant, essentially, elephant of a Heartless. So once you complete all those, the main story goes back to none other than Twilight Town. When you go there... Nobodies are just swarming the place. It is one hectic place. It is a war zone. For heartless, nobodies, everything. And Sword Doll and Goofy are trying to find the way to the nobody's homeworld. Like how the end of worlds was the heartless homeworld. They're trying to find where the organization and all the nobodies, their bases. And so, there's just a huge spike in Twilight Town, so they start searching around, and this gives you full range of all of Twilight Town, but we need to go is essentially back to the mansion, where you meet up with Mickey, and Sora tells Mickey that, as Mickey, where's Riku? Weren't you two together? Mickey goes, I can't say. It's not my position. Please stop trying my patience with this. And essentially, they go into the digital Twilight Town. And you can't explore the digital Twilight Town, by the way. It's just the digital basement of the mansion. And in this basement of the mansion, you find a portal... And when they go through, they meet up with none other than a shit ton of nobodies. And it's revealed that Axel actually is helping you defeat them. And with one final push, he uses all of his power to disband all of the uh, nobodies. And he dies. He is dead. His body withers away. This is the end of Axel. And so you go through the other side of the portal. And you enter the final world of the game. The world that never was. And like the title says. This is the nobody's homeworld. But this is also not the only. You won't find only nobodies here. There's also Heartless. Because the organization is also trying to control the Heartless, as well as they have control over all the nobodies. So some of the Sora, Donald, and Goofy continue blasting their way through this with the help of Mickey, sort of tagging behind. He's really no help in the gameplay. He's just there for sort of story reasons. And so, when they get to like the center of the town, uh, where there's like a giant skyscraper, 
Sora gets attacked by another member of the organization. But this is a member we all recognize. It's none other than Roxas. Roxas is essentially testing Sora to see if he's strong enough to defeat the organization. To defeat Xemnas and end this. And so after you defeat Roxas, he gives you a special keyblade known as the 2-in-1. After this point, you can unlock the final power of Sora. Which fully embraces Roxas and Sora together in a perfect sync. And so afterwards, they go to like where the giant castle is, but there's no way to get there. And so they pray and hope to find a way, and a beam of light comes out, pretty much saying, Come and enter! And everyone is skeptical. This has to be a trap and all that. But Sora goes, we can't deny it. We have to blow through it all. And so they enter the castle. And they're going all the way up. And finally, they get to like a center area where you face off with Zigbar. And throughout it all, Zigbar keeps calling Sora Roxas. Roxas, come back to us. Sora's just has no idea what he's talking about. So he's finally had it, and he defeats Zigbar. Zigbar is defeated, and he sees that Kyrie is fighting now with a Keyblade. And so now, Sora is rushing, because now he knows that Kyrie's there. Riku must be nearby too. And so now he's rushing through the floors where he finally meets up with Kairi. And Ansem. Now, you may be wondering what's up with Ansem. At first, Sora is very like defensive, like, what are you doing here? And Kairi goes, It's okay, it's Riku. With Sora obviously going, uh Kairi, are you alright? And so Kyrie goes, Sora, trust me, close your eyes. And when the two touch their hands, Sora realizes it is Riku. And he breaks down, wondering where he's been and how could you leave me and da 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 da. Way more emotional for refinding Riku than refinding Kyrie. Just want to put that out there. And so now, what happened with Riku is Riku was finding Sora's nobody because Nabade told him that he needed, that she needed Sora's nobody to make him whole so he can have all of his memories and his heart won't become unstable. And so Riku fights off with. Roxas, as Roxas is leaving the organization, and Riku gets his ass kicked by Roxas. And so he goes, I must embrace the darkness, rips off his blindfold, and becomes Ansem. But this is still Riku in control. And if you're wondering why Kairi is now wielding a Keyblade, Riku gave her the ability to. And I'm going to go more into that in the next game I'm going to be talking about. But we're nearing the end of this. So after you... Uh, after the reunion with... Wow, I could not speak there. When the three friends reunite, they continue up the floors. And they now have to face off with Luxord... Syx and that's it. Okay, yeah, it's just those two. After defeating them, Sora gains access to the next floor where they meet up with Diz. And essentially Sykes reveals to Sora, Zenith's ultimate plan. With every 
Sorry. Sykes more talks about what Xemnas told Sora back at the Thousand Heartless Battle is that essentially Xemnas is taking all the hearts released by Sora every time Sora defeats a Heartless. The heart is released and goes into a place called Kingdom Hearts. In this Kingdom Hearts, Xemnas is hoping to become whole again. He will regain a heart and become so much more powerful. So, Psyche just ultimately shows off the Kingdom Hearts that's being created by Sora, essentially. And so, when you go up there, it's revealed that Diz is actually trying to take Kingdom Hearts. He's trying to grab all the hearts in Kingdom Hearts and essentially analyze them because... He's a scientist. He wants to know what the heart is. Essentially, his device backfires, and Diz dies. Diz gets destroyed, and for whatever reason, Riku becomes himself. He's no longer, he no longer has to be blindfolded, and he no longer is Ansem. He's now Riku. And so... The gang, now with Riku actually joining the fight, goes up to the top floor where Maleficent and Pete are essentially battling the nobodies with their Heartless so that Sora can stop the nobodies. It's essentially like a point of interest. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend type of thing. And so... They reach the top where they face off with Xemnas. Well, more like Sora faces off with Xemnas. And he defeats Xemnas. And Xemnas goes into essentially the broken Kingdom Hearts because when Diz's machine broke, it essentially shattered the Kingdom Hearts. And so Xemnas goes into the Kingdom Hearts. And a giant door opens, and this is the final battle. With one last breath, the three Keybladers, excluding Kyrie, shoot their Keyblades up, unlock the door, and they go in to the dimension of the Kingdom Hearts. I'm going to call this dimension Xemnas's dimension. Because... The, the idea behind it is that Xemnas has now taken control of, essentially, this Kingdom Hearts created the world he wants to create. And so this is sort of his dimension. And so, now, Sora has to essentially, Sora and the gang, uh, Mickey, Kairi, get stuck behind get stuck behind the door from a blast. And so it's Sora, Donald, Goofy, and Riku to fight Xemnas. After a long, grueling battle, and I think there are a total of nine phases to this whole boss battle, uh, eventually they get to where Xemnas is, and he's in this big, regal arm armor with a giant sword and... Essentially, they shut down the reactors, they blow up the castle, and they defeat Xemnas. And they get back into the regular world that never was. With Xemnas going, I guess I just wasn't strong enough. And he disappears. Riku tries to open a gate and can't because his heart no longer belongs to the darkness. Like, his heart no longer... Well, he still uses darkness. He's not a being of darkness, so the gate, the dark gates, won't open for him. But essentially, Nomine opens one, which now I can get into this. After this fight, Roxas and Nomine pretty much come out of both Sora and Kyrie. Now, I'm gonna get into something. That's a bit of a theory of some sort. It's not confirmed, 
but I think it makes a whole lot of sense. Roxas is indeed Sora's nobody. When Sora became a Heartless back in Kingdom Hearts 1, this nobody was created. Now why it looks different, I'll get into that theory in the next game. But that is indeed Sora's nobody. Nominee, however, is an amalgamation of Sora's nobody as well as Kairi's. What I mean by that is that she's a nobody created because the being that became a Heartless was not the body that she came out of, but it did cause another nobody to be created. And this nobody is connected to Kyrie because it's Kyrie's heart that left the body. But because Kyrie is a princess of heart, her body does not become a heartless because the princesses of heart have no speck of darkness in their hearts. They are pure light, 100%, cannot be tainted by the darkness. And so her body didn't change. She never became a heartless, but her heart did leave a body that became a heartless. So Nominee is both uh, Sora's and Kyrie's nobody at the same time. But since it is since Nominee is Kyrie's nobody, is Kyrie's heart's nobody? It goes into her. So essentially they have their little Roxas and Nominee talk to both Kyrie and Sora. Roxas pretty much going like, look alive, dude. And then goes in and Kyrie's going, we will meet again. And Nominee going, we will meet again. And going into Kyrie. Now Kyrie, Donald, Goofy, Pluto, and Mickey go into this portal of darkness that essentially someone created. I think it was Nominee. I think it's supposed to be Nominee opened it for them. They leave. And as Sora and Riku are sort of like lagging behind, the ground shakes, the portal closes. So now it's just Sora and Riku. And you see the dragon from Zenith's uh, dimension fly through. And a platform ship, essentially, that Riku pilots and Sora, like, gets on, like, the side. It's essentially like a bike of some sort. And so, they destroy the dragon by, essentially, like, destroying the tail, then destroying the wings, then eventually attacking the head. Making it so it's stuck in, essentially, the space between world, is the space between dimensions, which the world that never was is technically like a world of in-betweens. And then you have a rematch with the regal-bodied Xemnas. We defeat him. The final phase is revealed. And it's Xemnas again, but he's in like a new attire and he has some new powers. Now this whole last phase is essentially one giant story-based battle. Essentially... You end the battle with essentially Sora and Riku teaming up together to essentially defeat him after being exhausted by one giant barrage of lasers. They defeat Xemnas, and they're so exhausted that they don't know exactly what to do. And so they actually end up... Uh, they end up... A bunch of nobodies come up after they're exhausted and they go, we can't win this. We have to escape through there. And a portal opens, which brings them into... It doesn't say it right now, but it's the realm of darkness, but like a beach area of it. Where Riku is like exhausted, he can't walk. And he goes, Sora, can you just bring me to the shore? So I can feel the waves on my feet. 
And so they're both sitting there. And eventually, the bottle that Kyrie put in the water in Destiny Islands way back when finally hits Riku's shoe. And he sees it to dress a Sora. And he gives it to Sora, who reads enough, which is essentially like, all the worlds may be different, but we all share one sky, in that everyone is still connected in some way. And as he's reading that, a portal opens up to Destiny Islands. And this is where the credits hit, but the ending is essentially, Sora and Riku get back to Destiny Islands, and everything's great... And it ends, the final, like, the epilogue of it is Sora getting a message from King Mickey. Riku and Kairi are also, like, reading it over his shoulder, and that's where it ends. And so, I understand this is a really long episode, but it is quite the story. And I probably did it no justice. So, this is the basics of essentially what I got out of Kingdom Hearts 2. I think it's a great game and all that, but the storyline can be a little confusing. But it pales in comparison for the rest of the series. So, when we next meet up, we'll be talking about Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye!